All right, welcome back. Uh, what I'm talking about now is hypothesis testing. Um, and we've did, done steps one through four. Uh, right now we're talking about uh, hypothesis tests of one population mean, assuming we know the population standard deviation. We'll complicate this. Um, we'll do lots more stuff over the course of this semester. This is where we're going to start. Um, but yeah, so we got to the point where we got where we computed a value of z, and we want to know how likely z is, which moves us to step five. Uh, we've gone from the data to the test statistic, and now we're going to do step five, which is evaluate the test statistic. There are two approaches. I'm going to take them in turn. So let's start here. So five a is the p-value approach p-value approach is my preferred approach, and the one I'm more likely to ask you to use. What this says is, well, once we have, w w what this answers is, how likely is z, in terms of, exactly, right? So how likely is z, and then what about the null alternative, or the null hypothesis? And that's what this question, that's what the p-value approach tries to answer. So if, now that we've done this, once we get to Z, we have to think about which test we're using. If we're doing a left-tailed test, so a left-tailed test, then um, our p-value is going to be on this here. It's going to be, let's say we have Z here. That's our test statistic. And our p-value is the size of the area in the left tail. This is p value. Now this is also true if uh, if our curve looks like this. Let me draw that again. So even if our curve looks like this and we have z over here, which usually won't happen, but it might it, it's not impossible. Then a left tailed test, the p value is gonna be this area. It's from the left tail all the way over to z. Okay? So that's our that's how you find our p value. Okay, so that's how you get your p-value for a left tail test. For right tail test, oops, uh, sorry about that. For right tail test, it's just the opposite. So right tail test, the p-value is going to be the. I'm going to. I'll just do this right here in orange. Right tail test. Then your p-value is this. It's this area. It's the area towards the right tail. There, it's that. Here, it's this. the size of the right tail. That's why they call it a right tail test. So is the right tail big or small? Um, and then last but not least, we have a two-tailed test. Uh, and this is a little bit tricky because it depends on which tail is closer. So let me draw the distribution one more time. So we have our z distribution in this case. A two-tailed test, the p-value is going to be twice the area from z to the closest tail. So for a two-tailed test depends which side is closer. So if you're here, let's say z is right here, then the p-value is going to be twice this. It's two times this area. On the other hand, if you're all the way over here, say you're here, then the p-value for a two-tailed test is going to be two times this area. And that's how you get the value for a two-tailed test, the p-value. So what you do is you take your z, and then you find that area to get the p-value. That's the first step of the p-value approach. The next step to finish off step five oops, is this. If your p-value is less than alpha, you reject the null. Why? Why? Well, how does that make sense? Okay, now if you recall, what we did was we set up a, our null, and then we chose a level of significance, right? That level of significance said what, how unlikely is unlikely enough. And we said it was alpha. And then our p-value essentially answers this question. How unlikely is x bar? 
if h0 is true. And that's our p-value. And so if we can say that our x bar is more unlikely than what we said was unlikely enough, then we follow through with it. We say, well, guess what? We're going to have to scrap h0 because there's just no way that that is a sound assumption. It's just not a reasonable assumption that that null is the true null. Um, and so you have to be careful about which test you're choosing, you know, which test you're using and which, how to get your p-value. But once you get your p-value, it doesn't matter which kind of test you're doing. Once you've gotten your p-value, if it's less than your level of significance, right? So if it's less than 5% or less than 10% or less than 1%, whatever, if it's less than your level of significance, then you will reject the null, which means you will accept the alternative. Accept HA. On the other hand, if your p-value is greater than alpha, we don't say you accept the, you never accept a null. You fail to reject the null. Basically, insufficient evidence to reject the null is what you say. Um, you might say the evidence is consistent with that hypo the null hypothesis. It's also consistent with lots of other ones, but that's as, be as well as we can do in that, in that moment. Um, so you fail to reject the null, and that's all you do. If your p-value is higher, it, you notice there's no equal. That's because the chance of your p-value being exactly equal to alpha is really small, so you can, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, okay. The nice thing about this is that you get an answer for your p-value if you do it this way. You get an answer to this question, how unlikely is x bar? Which means that you choose your alpha first. You should always choose your alpha first. But if you report your p-value and show that to somebody, then they can see, well, okay, well, not only did they not did they fail to reject, but it wasn't even close. Or, okay, they chose to reject, but it was kind of on the line, right? They can read that with your p-value. Okay, so that's step 5a. 5b is the critical value approach. Uh critical value approach. And it's another way to do the same thing, ultimately. It's another way to take our test statistic and do something with it. So what we do with a critical value approach is that we, we take our level of significance first. And this is much more like uh, what we did with uh, critical, uh, with um, confidence intervals. Sorry. So take alpha and use this to come up with a critical value, get a critical value. How do we do that? Well, this depends on our test. So we have a left-tailed test, then our critical value is the z sub alpha, so we'll call it, such that the area from the left tail to z is alpha. I can draw this for you. This looks like is oh, whatever your alpha is, like 0.05 or whatever, on your standard normal distribution. Your critical value is going to be this, so that this is alpha. So if this is like 0.05, well, then this is going to be negative 1.96 or something, right? That's how that works. Or I guess in that case, it would be negative 1.645. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a z alpha, and that's your critical value. We call it z sub alpha, and that's just saying how unlikely, which is what kind of z would be alpha unlikely, right, in a left tail test. That has an alpha, that kind of z has an alpha level of unlikelihood. If you did a right tail test, well, then your z alpha uh, is the uh, critical value such that the area, the area between z and the right tail, is alpha. So now we have a z here, where this over here, this area right here, is alpha big, and that's what that critical value is. Oops, a daisy. So that's a left tail test, right tail test, critical values. Um, then we have one more critical value for a two tail test. Uh, what that is, it's it's um, it's going to be a critical. It's going to be negative z alpha over two, z alpha over two. We have two critical values, which are these areas, right? These are these z's. You have a negative z alpha over two, and a positive z alpha over two, where the area in the tail above them is alpha over two, or the tail below them. 
their nearest, nearest tail is alpha over 2. Um, so yeah, so those give you critical values. And then the parts that I've shaded in and the tails, right? Let me shade in the purple ones so that they're all shaded in. I'm not a liar. Those parts are called the rejection regions. So this is a rejection region for a left-tailed test. We have a rejection region over here for a right-tailed test, and then these combined form the rejection region for a for a two-tailed test. Okay. Now what we do then is we take you get you go to step four, just like you do step four with the p-value approach. It's the same. You take your value z. You take your test and you say, well, where the heck is z? Um, if z falls, if z falls in the rejection region, then you reject the null. If it doesn't, then you fail to reject. So that's how, that's the way that the critical value approach works. If you choose the z's that would, you know, would, if not fail to reject. You choose the z's that w that are so extreme that if they fall outside, you're going to reject them. You're going to reject the null. <clears throat> and then you just compare your z that you get from your sample to the z that you've already selected, right? That that that's a test, you know, that's a critical value of a test statistic. And essentially that, you know, contains the same information, right? We're using alpha to get z, um, whereas before we used z to get p and then compared p directly to alpha. Uh, it's just a different way to, to do the same approach. Okay, so that's step five. Um, it's a little bit uh, complicated in the abstract, kind of, you know, but once once you get some practice, I think it'll make sense. What I would recommend, actually, is that you watch all, you know, now, now that you've seen all these videos, do some practice problems, come back and watch them again after you've done some practice problems so you can see the explanation again. And, uh, and just, you know, see if that helps, see if it, it makes it clearer. Okay, thank you guys. Um, next up is practice problems, and then, uh, and then yeah, we'll, we'll start making some headway. Um, we will look at the sigma unknown case after we do some practice with, uh, with, with the Z, with a, with a sigma known case. So thanks, and uh, see you again in a bit. Bye.